is Marty Friedman, and it's a real, a really great honor to be here with him and um, to be talking chiefly or on the occasion of uh, his new book, Pumpkin Flowers, which is uh, a deep book and a wise book, and a, it's a really very beautifully written book, uh, too, um, and it's, it's a memoir, uh, but it's much, much more than, than uh, than your own story, but uh, maybe just to just to start with it, it's uh, it's the only book. Uh, if you if you read only one book about the 15-year Israeli war in the security zone of uh, southern Lebanon, uh, it will be this book, <laughs> and um, it should be. Uh, maybe you can just tell us a bit about how you you came to be there and why. Sure. First of all, thank you so much. Uh, it's really an honor for me to be here with you. I'm one of my journalistic heroes. Um, and thank you so much for coming. Um, I was born in Toronto and lived there until I was 17 and left for a year after high school in 1995 to work on a kibbutz. It was supposed to be a year, and that was 21 years ago, so uh, things kind of got out of hand, and, and I'm still in Israel. Once I decided to stay in Israel I, uh, and become a citizen, I knew that that would trigger a draft notice, which happened in the summer of 1997, and I was... Uh, enlisted and um, sent to an infantry unit. At the time, the good infantry units were engaged in South Lebanon. There was a strip of land along the border, along the northern border inside Lebanon that Israel controlled in order to provide a kind of buffer zone um, to protect the border from attacks at that time, uh, chiefly from Hezbollah, which is a Shiite a militia. And um, I found myself um, kind of uh, having blundered into this strange little war from a quiet neighborhood in, in Toronto uh, at an isolated outpost about five miles north of the Israeli border called the Pumpkin. That's the, that's the very short version. I see some people cupping their ears. Can you turn up the volume on uh, Mahdi's headset? Yeah, thank you. Yes, that's a common complaint. I speak too fast. I'll do my best. So why, why uh, was this place called the Pumpkin? That's a great question. I mean, it seems like a kind of odd name for... Um, a forward operating base in yes. a modern war. Yes, so the American military likes to call things um, aggressive names. So, um, you know, it would be forward operating base Apache or something like that, something scary. And, and the American military calls its weapons scary names like Predator or Hellfire, things, things like that. Um, and if you listen to call signs on, um, on the U.S. military radio, It'll be, the call signs are cougar and bayonet and, and things like that. Um, it's completely different in the Israeli military. The Israeli military speaks a language that's largely floral in nature. Um, in Lebanon, I'm serious, in Lebanon, all of the, all, all these grim bases were about as grim as they get, right? These are kind of em emplacements surrounded by machine guns and barbed wire and um, dangerous, dangerous and grim places. They all had names of plants. So. Our outpost was called the Pumpkin, and nearby was Outpost Red Pepper, and Outpost Citrus, and Outpost Cypress, and Outpost Basil. Those were the names of the outposts. On, um, on the military radio, if you have casualties, if you want to report uh, wounded soldiers, you don't say, we have wounded soldiers. Military language is designed to provide you some distance from the, the stuff you have to describe in the Army. So in the US military, you know, for, a, for a fatality, you'd say KIA because the American military likes bureaucratic acronyms. So KIA sounds like a tax form or something. Um, the Israeli military has botanical euphemisms, so a wounded soldier is a flower. You'd say, we have a flower. And a, a dead soldier is an oleander. So if you had a, a wounded soldier and a dead soldier and you needed a helicopter, you'd say, we have a flower and an oleander and we need a thistle. The whole language was very botanical um, and very, very strange. It's one way of dealing with it, coding. And is coding that really stuff. like to cosmeticize, like to, to soften the blow for, not, obviously not for eavesdroppers, uh, who, but for, for the people who are saying it, that, that like you're looking at your dead buddy and, and, and somehow it's a little easier to say Oleander. Oleander. So every military provides soldiers with this kind of jargon. And I, I didn't think about it at the time. I was 19, 18, 19, and um, my mind was <laughs> unformed at the time. But um, uh, every military needs to provide soldiers not just with weapons, but with verbal weapons to allow them to function. So in the British military, for example, if you have um, um, a wounded soldier, I hope I'm getting this right, it's called it's T1. So 
instead of saying the name of the soldier, you wouldn't say Tom has lost his legs. You'd give the first two letters of his last name and the first four numbers of his serial number. So you'd say Alpha Charlie 4586 is T1. So you've removed yourself completely from the real world of your friend having had something absolutely terrible happen to him, and you're in a, you're in a different world with a different language. And it's the same thing in the Israeli military, except with, with this strange horticultural jargon that instead of co coding things with aggressive um, uh, terminology or with bureaucratic terminology, coats them with kind of agricultural terminology, which is very Israeli. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what the roots of it are. I interviewed a linguist about it, and he, he didn't know, but it's a pretty safe bet that it has something to do with the agricultural preoccupations of the early state or pre-state militias like the Palma, which of course were um, heavily uh, made up of, of kibbutzniks and people who had uh, farming on the brain. And did it work? I mean, did it for you, this young soldier, uh, achieve this function of making, I mean, uh, this young soldier who would become a writer and would think a lot about language and would end up drawing attention to this language by calling the book Pumpkin Flower, uh, <laughs> did, did it work? Did it actually have that effect? Or did it, it make it more absurdist and strange? It made it more absurdist and strange. It made the whole thing, you know, weirder to be at a place called the pumpkin and the flowers and the, we had weapon systems called, and this would never fly in the US military, we had um, the tank gunners had a night vision site that was called artichoke. Um, we had this system that warned us of incoming mortar shells and it was called buttercup, nourrit buttercup. Um, now this would never happen in the US military and it didn't, and at the time I had never been in any army and I'd never been anywhere basically except Toronto and this weird outpost. Um, so I didn't, it didn't strike me, but um, in the years that have elapsed and I, uh, having read some of the writing that's come out of the, the American uh, military experience for the past decade and a half, the language jumped out at me as, as, quite, as quite strange and uniquely Israeli. Were you already thinking of yourself, were you writing while you were there? I had done an internship uh, before my draft at a magazine called the Jerusalem Report, which at the time was a great uh, English language uh, bi-weekly news magazine. So I'd done some writing. I didn't really see that as a career. Uh, when I was in the army, most of the time I was too exhausted and depressed and preoccupied to actually do any, to do any serious writing. Um, so no, I don't, think that I, I don't think I thought I would one day write a book about this hilltop. And you say that you, when you made Aliyah, you knew that by becoming an Israeli citizen, you were, triggering, you were, you were essentially enlisting uh, sooner or later, within probably a matter of, at your age, a few months or a year. Uh, so you'd made that decision. Were you idealistic about it? Did you think of yourself as sort of uh, fighting for Israel, fighting for the Jews, or that you wanted to be an Israeli and this was simply a rite of passage? You say you were depressed, that most <laughs> of you write very... I mean, one of the important things to understand about this book is that unlike uh, most of what we read about Israel and unfortunately about war anywhere today, it's, it's, um, it's just an honest war memoir. It's not trying to dress things up one way or the other or make a, it, it's not polemical. It's not ideological. It's in some ways about a generation, which we can talk about also, that, that was feeling pretty unideological even in the midst of war. But it's also very much about, you know, what is it like to be a soldier? You're tired, you're hungry, you're... Uh, cold in Lebanon at night. You're bored. Uh, you're bored. Occasionally, you're scared silly. Uh, a lot of the rest of the time, you can't quite figure out why you're there. You're not thinking too hard about the political situation or the larger geostrategic context in which you're existing. Um, you're thinking about your buddies. Um, you're thinking about the women that aren't there uh, and maybe never were. And you're you're sort of, and, and in this case, you're very, very isolated. You're not in movement. You're not in war. You're at an outpost of progress, as Conrad called one, uh, and it didn't go well there either. Um, so, so, you know, what, what, what were you thinking when you went in? Were you thinking, or did you sort of think, I want to be an Israeli, this is what I got to do, I'm, and I'm, I want to be made an Israeli by this? It's kind of hard to reconstruct how little you right. once you once knew, and in my, when I think back, I, of course, I knew I, I knew I knew all of this, and I was well aware of the complexities, and I knew where all of this was going. Um, but if I'm honest about it, I think that it was the, it was the latter. I'm, I'm not a warlike person. I have no, you know, uh, um, you know, my father never served in any in any military, and he was a Vietnam era. He is a Vietnam era American with all of those associations. Um, but I knew that it, if I wanted to be an Israeli, I had to do this. Is that and, how he ended up in Canada? Um, he, um, 
had a deferment before he went to Canada. This is very important in our I family. <laughs> no, I ask because it's, it's important in any family that ended up in Canada at that time with that age. He did so, end up in know. Canada at that time, but it was after he had the deferment. Um, okay. Um, um, so you don't have to thank Jimmy Carter for being allowed to come here? Uh, <laughs> um, no. Um, <laughs> Um, I knew that if I wanted to be an Israeli and not just be a foreigner living in Israel, and there are many people like that, I had to do, I had to have this experience along with the Israeli guys my age. So I ended up on a kibbutz, having gone to Israel at 17, I ended up on a kibbutz, a very small, also isolated hilltop. Weird, weirdly, I seem to have a, an affinity for places like that, a little religious kibbutz called Ma'ale Gilboa, which is about two hours north of Jerusalem. And the kids on the kibbutz um, ad basically adopted me, and they were all going into the army. So. I went in with them, and I knew that I would come out the other end like them, and that's more or less what, what happened. Bizarrely, my experience of becoming Israeli happened in Lebanon. Were you religious when you went in? Um, I come from a traditional family, so yeah, you know, more or less. Did you uh, become less so in the military, or? Um, I, 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 think mean, I, always, I don't know how religious you are now, but exactly, I, 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 I think I've, don't. I think I've always been, I, I've always been religious basically to the same, to the same extent. Um, I find a lot of meaning in, in Jewish tradition. I think, um, I thought then and I think now that Shabbat is the greatest invention of all time, certainly now, um, in the world of electronic devices. Um, I don't have a deep you know, religious soul or anything like that. And so you, you end up at this place without, what were you told you were going there to do? Like, I mean, usually when soldiers are sent, especially to a front line or an outpost or across, I mean, you weren't in Israel, you were across the border in a sort of nebulous no man's zone that actually was a foreign country. That's right. Um, certainly Israeli military lore and history and the stories that we know in the rest of the world is this highly motivated army, this army that's sort of, if not uh, either a, either very idealistic or very indoctrinated, depending how you look at it, but at least has a very clear idea of what it's doing and why it's there. And uh, if it's not absolutely convincing, they're out of there. What was going on? What did they tell you? <laughs> I'm not sure I want Israel's enemies to hear this, um, <laughs> because of course we're all incredibly motivated and indoctrinated and ruthless and willing to sacrifice, and the mission is entirely clear to but us. But you left that part out so, of the book. <laughs> <laughs> so please don't invade us, is what I'm trying to say. Um, the Israeli military, because it's a draft, is full of all kinds of people. Um, it's not at all like the US military. A lot of the guys there, weirdly, in the best units, it's a very kind of contradictory um, situation. In, in the best units, um, you'll find mainly middle class kids who have very mixed feelings about, about it all. Um, so motivation is it's a problem. You, you, you basically have guys who understand that it's necessary, what they're doing is necessary. They're proud of what they're doing. But in my time, at least, they were very unideological or anti-ideological. Um, they were very cynical about the military. They were not, you know, uh, they would find it very difficult to talk about Zionism or no one ever talked about that at the outpost. And I write this, there was no ideology at the outpost. And Herzl and Ben-Gurion, those were just streets to the kids at, at the outpost. There were schools. Um, it's a different, it's a completely different generation. And I think when people in the West are reading about Israel, they're still, they're still kind of stuck in an Israel that, um, you know, a generation or two ago when Golda Meir meant a lot and Moshe Dayan meant a lot and the Six Day War meant a lot. It doesn't anymore. It doesn't and the country's in a completely different place. I think it might well be in a better place, but it's certainly a, a different country made up of a very different kind of, of people who I think are not understood well enough um, outside of the country. There's a, there's a saying, I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase it wrong, but you describe the, the guys in the company before you uh, but your company, but the, the rotation or two before you, two or before, uh, where the expression would be, you know, sort of, if it, 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 the going gets tough and you just sit there, you know, with a question mark at the end. And they made their slogan, so when the going gets tough, you just sit there, period. Right. Um, right. That was sort of the, the, not, the way you captured that mood. Um, but why, when, where did that come from? In other words, in... Well, I'm a bit older than you, and so the people I went to high school with, if they were in Israel, would have gone into the first Lebanon war in the early 80s. They were being brought up on sort of post Six Day War, post 48. They were the first generation born there, and they had a very different idea than either refugees or pioneers. Uh, they were Israeli because they were born there. But you're talking about people who are Israeli because they were born there to people who were born there. That's right. And, and that is really very far removed from any, I mean, that's more like us in America after generations. You're not here because you had some big idea about settling America. You're here because 
it happens to be that way. Right. And you may very well believe in it and want to defend its existence. I mean, that's a point you make. They're not ideological, but they didn't have to be there. What does that mean? They all could have chosen a different tour, a different service? If you really didn't want to be a combat soldier, you could get out of it. And the units that were deployed inside Lebanon at these isolated outposts were uh, basically volunteer units that were a bit more specialized than the average infantry unit. So if you were at one of these outposts, it meant that you had chosen that, that kind of service. I think for most of my friends, um, they were protecting their home. There wasn't anything very complicated about it, and it wasn't an idea. I don't think anyone in my platoon, maybe with a few exceptions, you know, had ever read any of the Zionist thinkers except you know, for what they made them read in high school, like American kids have to read you know, the Constitution or, or something like that. It was their home. This was expected of them. If you were a man, this is what you did, and you tried to do it as well as you could possibly do. There was a social dynamic where you know, it was good to come home and have stories to tell, and it was good to come home wearing certain insignia and not other insignia. You didn't want to come home, at least at the kibbutz where I was living, with, from a desk job. You know, that was, not, that was not acceptable, but it wasn't ideological. It was, it was social and it was quite natural. Mm -hmm. and, and you write a lot about, I mean, I say it's a memoir uh, because it is, but here's this hill and you, the hill becomes like the theater. Uh, you, you say at the beginning that the hill speak, spoke to you when you got there, it speaks to you still, and you describe it also as you're the sort of historian of this hill that's totally insignificant, and then acquires significance by this Israeli presence on this hill, draws all these Hezbollah attacks and these uh, combat incidents, and then after the Israelis leave, becomes, again, nothing. So it really is almost like a stage set. It's sort of like some sort of, the way Shakespeare talks about a stage in the Tempest or something, you know, everybody comes, and then the revels are ended, they're not very much revels. But to get that history of that place, you go back and you uh, get very involved in the story, particularly of one soldier, Avi Ofnel, who was there before you. How did you uh, come to him and sort of, it feels a little bit like he's a bit of an alter ego. He's somebody who gets there, he is uh, a writer, becoming a writer, he's reading a great deal at this base, He's uh, starting to write mostly in letters to several girls from his age group uh, back home and, and describing things in a way that seems, you say you weren't doing that yourself at the time, but it seems to be something that like you picked up his thread. I knew that um, I had seen something interesting on this hill, but I, but I also knew that I'm not important. You know, I didn't do anything particularly important. I'm not, I'm not important except as someone who happened to see it and be able to write about it. So it is a memoir in that I saw these events and, and it's told in first person, at least parts of it, but, but I didn't want it to be about me. You know, um, Orwell's book, Homage to Catalonia, was, was kind of a model for me in that regard mm -hmm. because that's a book that's written in the first person by George Orwell, but it's not about George Orwell. It's about Spain. And I thought that was great, and I wanted to do something similar. So the way to do that was to be in the book, because I'm the glue basically tying the story together, but also to bring in other stories of other guys, some of whom I knew who had been at this hill, uh, some of whom I'd, I'd never met. I found people through a chat room on the internet, and Israel being the kind of place that it is, one cell phone number led to another, and led to another, and led to another, and soon I had this kind of network of guys who had nothing in common, and most of whom had never met each other, but who had all passed through the pumpkin at some point. The big find for me was Avi Ofnel, who had been at, at the pumpkin from 1994, which is really when the hill became notorious because of a, a specific incident that happened on the hill, a specific Hezbollah attack that was filmed and shown on television. Uh, by he, them? By them. It was one of the early uh, media attacks they came up, up the hill with an armed force and a camcorder. This was so in 1994. First, when he says media attacks, he means one of the first actions by these Islamic uh, attackers, where they film their own action as sort of the objective of the action is to get the film, get the film. right? In other words, you're not trying to gain territory. I mean, of course, if they'd taken the territory, that would make for a better they film. They but they, they weren't they expecting to take territory. That wasn't the objective. The objective was to produce a film in which they are shown heroically fighting against this overwhelming seeming enemy and prevailing at least insofar as they come home with a f film of it. That's right. So that happened at the pumpkin and that's actually what made the pumpkin famous uh, briefly. Um, and Avi was, uh, was on the hill from 94, which is the year that happened, until 97, which is the year I went in the army. So he was useful as a way of telling the story of those years and he, he was also um, a writer, so he wrote letters from, from the Hill, which were 
beautiful, I think, and yeah. he was he was very um, you know, he wasn't yet. He was hitting his stride, as right. He was a very young guy. He wasn't ideological at all. He was a cynic, and he was cynical about the army. He was. He told people he was moving to Ireland after the army. Um, he India, had a thing about Alaska, Ireland. He had all these fantasies. And, right? and Alaska, he had a whole Alaska scenario. Um, but he had a special. Uh, he had a thing about Ireland, and um, and he was just kind of a wonderful. Um, character who was much more advanced than I was uh, at, at the time that I was on the hill. He could see the army from the outside. He could see a situation from the outside. He was critical of everything. Uh, I think he was kind of hard to be around <laughs> because he was kind of a tiring, a tiring um, personality, um, but someone who was you know, wise, wise beyond his years. And you didn't know him. You never met him. I never met him. So obviously, you say he was there till 1997. And the other time the pumpkin became very famous was in 1997 when there was this terrible calamity that happened to the people of the pumpkin, but not related to the pumpkin. You want to sure. tell a little I mean, bit some about the helicopters? People, sure. I mean, some of you might remember um, one of the few incidents from the security zone that, uh, that entered the collective memory and that remains there to some extent is a crash of two helicopters in February 1997. Um, two big transport helicopters. Um, carrying 73 soldiers. One was headed to Beaufort Castle, which was one of the Israeli outposts in our sector of the security zone, and one was headed to the Pumpkin. And when they were still over northern Israel, the, the helicopters collided with each other and everyone died. And that was really the, the central, it ended up being the central event of that time because it, um, it sparked a protest movement called the Four, Four Mothers, Mothers, which ended up over a period of several years getting getting the army out of Lebanon. And I mean, the other thing is, it, it, as you point you make, that this defining incident is not some triumphant Hezbollah grinding victory over the will of the Israelis. It's, uh, it's an, accident. an accident. I mean, it's, it's a completely, it's not even, I mean, you call it a self-inflicted wound, and it is, uh, but it's, it's, it's almost more abstract than that. Right, it, it's just an accident. That's right, people still refer to it in Israel as kind of an atomic bomb that went off in the country. The country's so small, and the military is webbed so, um, so intimately into the, into the society, unlike in America. In America, you could lose two helicopters, you know, as we were discussing earlier, and, and probably for most people, it wouldn't impact their, their own lives because the military is such a separate group in American society. Um, it's not the way it is in Israel, so when 73 guys died in a minute, um, in February 1997, the entire country was, was devastated, and people still talk about it like an atomic bomb, kind of this vast catastrophe released by something completely minuscule and ridiculous, which was a series of mistakes made by air crew, basically, in northern Israel one night in, in February. And that ended up being... So they, were just, they were just both shuttling. They were like buses, basically. I mean, they, they were, were like just buses. shuttling people from... They were like buses. The, the roads in Lebanon, I mean, it's connected to the kind of worsening of of the situation in South Lebanon, which is familiar also from the American experience, the roads were becoming more and more dangerous because of what would now be called IEDs. We didn't call them IEDs. No one used that term at the time. This was the 90s. We called them um, mitanim, which in Hebrew means payload. So Hezbollah really masters of the art of the IED. They were making the roads more and more dangerous, and the convoys were getting hit by these things. So the army decided to fly the Lebanon garrisons in on these big helicopters. And that decision led to this accident, which ended up bringing about the collapse, basically, of the military strategy in Lebanon and the end of the whole Lebanon enterprise a few years later. Uh, so you're there in that, in, I mean, first of all, you're going in on the heels of that. Right. I went into the army a few months later, and my platoon commander was the only member of his pl platoon who had survived because he'd been in officer's training. So the rest of his platoon was on the helicopter. He was training to be an officer, and everyone was gone but him. When you, when you said that um, you saw something from the hill, I mean, you saw a lot of things from the hill. Uh, you saw these things through night vision goggles. You saw lands Bushes, landscapes that you also speak very movingly of. But you also saw a kind of historical pivot going on that you describe as, I mean, the book is a coming of age story, both of yours and of the other guys. But it's also like coming into an age, coming of age into an age that's like, Unexpected, and you and you describe how uh, in the 90s, with all of the hope about peace, you sort of thought of yourselves as well. We're like this is the end of something, 
and you all and, and of course that didn't work out and and it also was this feeling that this is the new middle east and it is a new middle east but you're saying it was a completely different new middle east than what people meant by the phrase the new middle east at that time maybe you can just try to summarize a little bit what how how that pivot worked and sort of when that became something one was more conscious of. Right, certainly not at the time, and that took years to figure out. I made an initial attempt to write about this immediately after the experiences, and the, I had no perspective on the events, and no one could have understood what the 90s meant. In retrospect, I think in the 90s, the pendulum was swinging in the Middle East, and it was swinging somewhere that no one expected. If you read newspaper clippings from that time, and that's what I spent a lot of time doing, looking for little fragments of information about the security zone, all the newspapers were devoted almost entirely to the peace process. Um, if you remember from, from the 90s, that's what people thought was going on. Leaders were meeting, they were making agreements, um, a new Middle East would be, uh, would be created in which we would, you know, we would go to Damascus to shop and we'd you know, taste the nightlife in Beirut and people from Baghdad would come to the beach in Tel Aviv and, and things like that. Um, there were actually maps published in Israeli papers showing the new highways that, that were gonna be built across across the Middle East. Um, so everyone thought that was the new Middle East. Um, in retrospect, that was kind of a fantasy or a, a flash in the pan. And under the surface of all of this, a new Middle East was being created in South Lebanon. And what we saw as 19-year-olds, too young and stupid to understand what we were seeing, we saw the rise of the new Middle East when those guys came up the hill with their video camera, um, when they pioneered the IED. Um, when they pioneered the suicide bomber, that's also a South Lebanon innovation. What they were doing was creating what we now understand is, is the new Middle East. So the pendulum was swinging somewhere completely different. Um, and it was happening in a few different places simultaneously as these things tend to do. So um, 1994 was that attack on the pumpkin with the camcorder. 1993, the World Trade Center was bombed. An attack that people thought at the time was kind of a curiosity. Right. Um, Hamas was stirring, Al Qaeda was stirring, Hezbollah was was rising, and this idea was spreading across the Middle East under the kind of stagnant surface of this region with its dictators. And um, something very important was happening when everyone was looking somewhere else. I mean, you go so far as to say very clearly that that without understanding this, in a sense, that this is the key or the unseen stepping stone, at least, to the wars, uh, the post 9-11 wars of the United States, that to understand what our experience in Afghanistan, our experience in Iraq, uh, which has not been a positive experience uh, for uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, or the United States, um, or the broader Middle East. So I'm curious about something you said earlier, where you said, we're not in that place of Golda Meir and Moshe Dayan and, and the heroic Zionist uh, sort of survivalist uh, struggle uh, that people got very mobilized by, but we may be in a better place. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering how this new new Middle East, the unseen result of this pretty bleak period where you have, and you also describe essentially the Israelis as defeated in Lebanon, uh, retreating and the other guys being militarily inferior, but more determined. That sounds familiar to Americans, right? And so forth. I mean, more determined, at least as far as Lebanon goes, right. um, if not uh, Israel being more determined about Israel, and, and, uh, and sort of indefatigable, so that, you know, a kind of permanent guerrilla war that now obviously it's exploded to a whole new stage even since you wrote the book uh, in the last two years or so, uh, with Syria completely falling apart with ISIS and the exes. How is that a better place? As, and particularly, how can that be a better place for Israel in that hostile sea? Right, so the region, I mean, has become very dark and the bottom has completely fallen out. And, um, you know, my apartment in Jerusalem is about a three hour drive from Syria. Um, I could leave my apartment in Jerusalem and if the borders were open, I could be in Baghdad for an early dinner. You know, this is the, this is, it's all going on around us. So the region has um, become catastrophic to an extent that no one could have imagined, certainly not in the 90s, 15, but yeah. even five years ago, and maybe even two years ago, which is when I submitted this, this manuscript. Um, so I have nothing positive to say about the region, unfortunately. <laughs> However, because Israel has always been mobilized for conflict, mobilized maybe for a different conflict, but mobilized for conflict, and because Israelis have learned to keep the region at bay and to kind of live between between bombardments, um, as we did at the pumpkin, um, the the fuel, the strange fuel that drives Israel, um, if anything, has al has almost picked up steam in the past ten years. Right, if you've been to Israel, or if you've just been following, you know, the Israeli economy or Israeli culture, the country you know, almost seems like it's in overdrive. Um, you know, the, the economy's 
booming. And real estate prices, unfortunately, for some of us, are through the roof. Um, we got hit by about 4,000 rockets and mortars in the summer of 2014, and real estate prices in Israel went up over the summer. Um, you know, the movies and um, just the cultural life of the country, which you don't have to take my word for it, you can just come to Tel Aviv and hang out there for, for a week and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Tel Aviv, in the same period of time, has become one of what is said to be one of the best cities in, in the world, um, kind of captured this Middle Eastern spirit that used to exist in places like Alexandria and Beirut and this kind of cosmopolitan Middle Eastern centers. Um, and you, you can find it in Tel Aviv and it, Israel is the only country in the region where you can be you know, safely, well certainly Jewish, but, um, but gay or Christian or Baha'i or Zoroastrian or Druze. Um, and it's, a, it's an incredibly successful and compelling country. Now, what the connection between that and the collapse of the rest of the Middle East is, I can't really say, except to note that it's happened at, at, at the same time. Um, I think the, kind of the, the underlying metaphor of the book, which is this fortress on a hill, um, ends up helping me understand the country. So I still, I mean, it's because of my own experience, but I see the pumpkin everywhere. I just I look around and I see the pumpkin. Um, um, and Israel feels kind of pumpkin-like. It doesn't feel like you know the, the, hope, the hopeful decade of the 90s is over, but it feels kind of like a hilltop where you that's Sorry, no, I mean, that's part of the thesis of, um, Mari wrote these two pieces about the press coverage of, the, uh, of Israel and uh, kind of going against the grain, obviously, in a big way, saying eh, Israel is actually overcovered. Uh, that it wasn't simply about bias this way, that way, though it was also about that. Uh, but it was, uh, but it was, it was specifically about like the exaggeration of Israel's significance in global affairs altogether, and how excessive attention actually isn't particularly beneficial uh, to, to, to accurate coverage. Um, and he was looking particularly at his former uh, organization, the Associated Press, but not singling it out by any means. And it was in the aftermath of the uh, Gaza War of 2014, and he was focusing in part on on this idea of sort of you know really the story here is this tiny. Outpost. I mean, that's the way you describe Israel there. I hadn't made the connection as explicitly till you did just now, but there's this huge story of the Middle East, and then there's this insane flooding of journalists into this tiny little outpost, um, which is kind of the opposite of the way it was with the pumpkin, where you were completely ignored. ignored, and in fact, your book is about the fact that nobody, not only were you ignored at the time, but nobody's ever really reckoned with that whole historical period that you now see as this hinge of history. Right, well, it's interesting to make a comparison with the work you've done. Um, your, your book on Rwanda, We Wish to Inform You, um, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the longest title in the history of publishing? Not really, probably. Not really. But, uh, I wish to inform you that tomorrow we will be, we will be killed with our families. That's right. Stories from Rwanda, uh, one, of the great, one of the great books. Um, you know, to, uh, as a kind of contrast between maybe the most covered story on earth per capita, which I think you can make an argument that Israel is that over the last quarter century or so, with a continent that's completely ignored. I mean, when, you, when you're in Kigali or, or Rwanda, how, many, you know, how much Western interest is there? How many reporters do you, do very, you meet? Very, little. I mean, when I first went there, there was like none. Um, and uh, there'd been, there's an Africa press corps, an international press corps in Africa. And of course, what's most interesting is that in the last decade and a half since I first, or 20 years since I started going there, uh, 21 years now, um, it, uh, you now have a reasonably uh, uh, sort of modernized African press corps. Mm. So there are some good African uh, newspapers out of Nairobi and, and some radio and television and out of South Africa, you have a press that, that actually functions. But for the most part, at that time, there was almost nobody there. And one of the reasons that at the very beginning of the Rwandan genocide in April of 1994, there was almost no international attention to it or coherent press coverage of it was that the entire African press corps was in South Africa uh, for the post-apartheid elections that brought in uh, Nelson Mandela. Mm. So, uh, you know, and of course one of the knocks on the African cov of coverage of Africa and the international press is that we only pay attention to, you know, bloody, gory, terrible stories of calamity, even when there's a good story. In fact, this was a press corps, many of whom believed quite deeply in the anti-apartheid cause, most of whom, I would say probably all of whom, and who were very excited to be there for this kind of best of times story when the worst of times hits in a country that very few of them knew much about because it really wasn't that geostrategically or otherwise important. It was tiny. It, it's the size of West Virginia and had a population smaller than New York City. Um, and uh, it's landlocked and isolated and without any natural resources. So it really was a country that uh, only drew attention if it 
had a problem uh, in the press. And so there were very few people who even knew what was going on, to put it into a context. Um, not a problem you're going to have uh, in Israel, obviously, though you can argue about endlessly about who knows what's going on. Um, but but there, there's this question of proportionality of the world's attention and what that does to things and what it, uh, what it means even that in the United States, look, in Israel you can function without knowing Hebrew, though it's a handicap. It's um, arguably, if you know a few European languages and English, you're in pretty good shape. Um, and in uh, the Middle East, we had almost no foreign correspondents coming into 9-11, certainly, who spoke Arabic. Very, very few. Uh, we had even fewer in our State Department and our government offices and so forth. So we were completely cut off in that region with, again, you'd have the sort of bureaus you have in Africa. You know, you'd have a, a maybe, I don't know where it would be based, probably a Cairo bureau right. uh, that covered four or five Middle Eastern countries um, at, at the time. And then you'd have a Jerusalem bureau that had uh, probably uh, five times as many people covering well, when I was hired, mostly the West Bank and the right. occupation period. I mean, which is, I guess Israel is about, if you, as a percentage of the Arab world, landmass wise, is 0.2 percent. So one fifth of one percent of the landmass of the Arab world, and when I, and it's 0.01 percent of the of planet Earth, one one hundredth of one percent. When I started to work at the AP in 2006, we had more than 40 full-time news staffers covering the Israel story at the AP just for the AP, um, and I'm not counting fixers and drivers, I'm counting just news staff, um, like me, print reporters, and still photographers, and TV crews, and at the, at the time in Syria, we had one part-time local stringer who'd been approved by the Assad regime. That was the AP contingent in Syria. Um, we had more people covering Israel than we had covering all of the countries where the Arab Spring eventually erupted, combined, or um, than in all the countries of sub-Saharan Africa combined. So, you know, one of the reasons that the West was so caught off guard by the implosion of the Middle East over the past couple of years is because for decades no one covered it. And when people said the Mideast conflict, what they meant was Israel. That was the Mideast conflict, if you, if you remember. It, was the, it wasn't even, I mean, as you've pointed out at times, it's not just Israel, it's the Israel-Arab conflict, Israel-Palestinian conflict. But Israel itself is not I mean, one of the things that you're doing is you're writing about Israel as an Israeli, writing about Israel unto, it, you know, unto its own experiences. Right. When you talk about, you talk about how all the soldiers there believed in what they were doing, that it was, it was right, it was probably the right thing to do, whether it was just defending their homes or so, but it was the right thing to do. Right. But they obviously come to question whether it was worth it. Uh, you point out that in the course of this uncovered, unnamed, 15-year period in Lebanon, the overall Israeli death toll was about equivalent to the Six-Day War uh, death toll, so significant. Um, and, and yet it was a few here, a few there, it was right. little incidents, it wasn't sort of an ongoing combat operation in the same way. Like Iraq, you know. And then you talk about this fortress mentality. How can Israel maintain that fortress mentality with the occupation, with uh, the relationship it's got with the West Bank, with its sort of siege mentality, without just hardening. I mean, you talk about a post-ideological, somewhat cynical, uh, indifferent, turned inward generation. You say it's very, very high energy for what it's doing culturally and economically. But isn't there a huge cost there uh, to the world uh, and to, 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 I mean, to, to, to Israel? Sure. I mean, yeah, the answer is yes. I've been, uh, as part of a new project that I'm working on, I've been looking at a lot of material from 1948, um, press clippings and, and writing from 1948, and it's, and, and it's heartbreaking because they think that the war in 1948 is going to end and there's going to be peace. And that's what people thought. Um, in 1967, people thought there was going to be this war and then there would be peace. In uh, 1973, people kept expecting peace to happen. There would be one more war. We'd, we'd pay this price and then and then there will be peace. And over the past decade and a half, since, since the collapse of the peace process, since the Lebanon withdrawal, kind of cosmically it happens in the year 2000, which is strange. But the, the pendulum really swings in the year 2000. <laughs> I'll let the you know, mystics figure that one out. But um, um, there's, a, there's kind of a deep psychological change, which is that it's never gonna end, right? It's never gonna end. And we might not have a Yom Kippur war where we lose you know, 2,500 guys in three weeks. Um, but it's not going to end. There's not going to be. There's not going to be peace, and the region is going to be a disaster for decades. Um, what does that mean for us? It means that we're going to have to keep on losing guys in these inconclusive border 
wars, you know, like we had in, in Gaza two years ago, there, there are going to be more, more rounds like that. Um, and basically what we can hope for is to keep the region at bay uh, to the extent possible as we live inside our outpost, you know, inside, our, inside the pumpkin, basically. Um, and we kind of make do with what, you know, with what we have and, um, and live as well as we can. That's the Israeli of 2016. No, no big ideas. Um, no, you know, there's not a lot of, uh, there's, an, there's an ideological hardcore on the right, of course, and you hear a lot about them. Um, but most of the country is kind of um, resigned at the moment. So the question is, uh, how do we maintain ourselves in this psychic state where you know we don't have any very big ideas, most of us. Um, we don't have any real hopes of kind of a utopian turnaround in our situation, which people had until recently, which was this, the, the situation when I moved to Israel. That's what I thought was going on in 1995. Um, how do we do this without losing our soul, you know, without becoming so hard that the country becomes unrecognizable? Um, that's, that's a real problem, especially since the conflict hits so close to so many of us. So America can keep the conflict on the margins of its society because the conflicts are far and because the military is peripheral in the society. We don't have that luxury. You know, mo most people are in the army. Right, I mean, how do you protect your soul when you're, when you're saying uh, generation after generation has to sort of, you know, I mean, you talk about the army as the end of childhood. You know, sort of you go from, ha you go from the home of your parents and the bed of your childhood to the army and your commanders, and that this is really the, the and then you talk about yourself as an making aliyah, becoming, becoming Israelified by this. So this is sort of what makes people uh, men or grown-ups uh, and makes, uh, you know, uh, people Israelis, and that service is essentially uh, grinding negative uh, exertion of force against uh, miserable neighbors, uh, often feeling very oppressed, often feeling uh, in, the, in the occupation, obviously, uh, just a, a service that there's no really uh, great way to... You don't capture the Temple Mount at the end of the... You don't, you don't feel good about it at all, uh, even from a nationalist or a survivalist point of view. It's just crude and hardening. How, how does that work uh, over time? And I guess one thing that strikes me is you, you talk about Israel as an outpost, and the way the world sees it is as an outpost of the West, uh, to a large degree. That some of the world's attention is on the idea that this is a sort of Western project in the Middle East, that it is uh, European Jews with European money and American money for defense, uh, to a, a significant degree. And you've written a lot about the fact that that's just actually inaccurate. Right. That like half of Israel's population is Mizrahi, is, is Jews from the non-European, specifically Arab world. Your first book's about the Jews of Syria. Your second book is about being across the border from <laughs> Israel in Lebanon, and I should mention, uh, there's a significant chapter where you go, and I think you kind of make it sound like it's easier than it probably was, uh, both practically and internally to keep your cool through this whole thing, and he goes using his Canadian passport to do what he can't do as an Israeli into Lebanon. Uh, after his service, how many years later was that? Two years later. Two years later, comes around the long way, uh, back through Toronto, uh, and as a tourist with his Lonely Planet Guide goes back to the pumpkin, um, winding his way down through his bola country, meeting lots of Lebanese he likes a lot, but who aren't too keen on Israel. Um, I like that you find a good way whenever they say, you know, Jews, they're kind of hard to take, and you're like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, you find your way of not having to uh, uh, endorse anti-Semitism while giving, uh, uh, I guess I wasn't it's not an Israeli who wouldn't agree, but, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> but then you, but, but that you, you really are writing about Israel from a periphery or a perimeter that's very different from the conventional history of it, and, and that makes a kind of counter argument about that. Maybe you can just. Sure, I mean, I think that, the, this, that Israel has been um, um, reduced to a kind of caricature in the West. And for some people, it's a good caricature, um, and some, for some people, it's a bad caricature, but it's a very simple story because people can only take simple stories, and only a simple story will fit in a 600 word news story or in a 90 second TV spot. So, you know, for many people on the left, left side of the, of the spectrum, which is you know, where I would place myself. Israel is a, a symbol of strength or, or worse, you know, oppression, a mechanized European society that oppresses non-Western, uh, non-industrialized people. Um, th um, the, the country is so much more complicated than that, of course. Um, as you said, half of the Jews in Israel had nothing to do with Herzl or socialism or the Holocaust or the kibbutz. They come from the Middle East. And those people aren't a footnote in the story. They're 
you know, if it's 50%, which it is, they're as much the story as Herzl and, and Ben-Gurion, and I think that in the 21st century, if you're looking to understand Israel, um, you have to think a lot less about the Warsaw Ghetto and a lot more about Kurdistan, because Israel and the Kurds have a lot in common. They're minorities that have to kind of survive in the Middle East, and I think that's, that is the way to think about it, and I think that's the way people will think about it, um, and I'm trying to, to write about that now, and that's what the next project that I'm working on is, um, is going to focus on. I should give you the signal as you ask me to do that. I think, our, I think it's time for questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> The clock's facing you, but he, um, so there are mics that Stephanie and Maggie have that will go around. Oh, you hold it. Can I hold it? <laughs> now I'm going to be nervous. Um, okay, so. Uh, let me collect my thoughts. It was re very interesting and really great to hear you both in, in conversation like this. Um, my question has to do uh, with, it's sort of a question for Mr. Gurevich, um, and also first, I suppose, because I was in uh, Kiryat Gat the summer of 2014 and uh, was kind of experiencing that war uh, and reading, I'm not, I don't read Hebrews, so I was reading the Western press as I constantly do, and I couldn't understand the coverage until I read, um, you know, Mr. Friedman's piece, you know, the insider's guide to the most important story in the world, and I thought it was an incredibly important piece, and it really changed my perspective, and then I read the follow-up piece in The Atlantic, and I was struck by, uh, what his his analysis of the media coverage, and I wondered whether it had made an like what kind of impact it made, and I guess that's my question for Mr. Gravich, who's inside, who's an insider, <laughs> and kind of a, and and I I mean I've noticed that the New York Times is covering they have a a reporter now Dia Haddad that they didn't have before, and I've noticed that, and I'm wondering whether that it, could, you could sort of draw a direct line between that media critique that Mr. Friedman made in 2014 and that kind of coverage, and whether it's had internally within the media some, what kind of impact you think it's had? I, I, you know, it's nice of you to say that you think that I would know about this, but I don't. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a magazine writer who, and not, this isn't my territory, and, um, and I'm not uh, at all aware of the way that the mechanics of these media organizations work. So, I mean, Mati could answer that, I'm sure, much better. Uh, whether changed whether he wants to or not, he, I'm sure he knows. No, I don't mean answer it, but I'm sure he knows whether he wants to or not. A lot more about sort of what happened or didn't happen as a result of, uh, of that critique. Um, yeah, just briefly, because the answer could be long, but the opposition to those pieces from inside the media was very loud and the support for them was very discreet, but there was also a lot of people, of course, who know that, um, that what I wrote was, um, was true, right? The numbers that I cited about reporters that's, people know that, and it's not, I'm not the only one who noticed that it's, um, that it's kind of strain, I, strange. I was in a unique position as someone who had had a job like the job I had, but who didn't need it anymore, and which is a, a strange uh, position to be in at age 36 or whatever I was when I wrote it. So that's why I wrote it, but many other people understand that it's true. Um, the, the media um, zeitgeist, which is part of the kind of general Western I hate saying you know Western liberal zeitgeist because that's me, but that you know what I'm you know what I'm talking about. It's kind of like an aircraft carrier. It's really big and it sails in a certain direction, and it doesn't turn very easily. So I'm kind of I'm a guy in a rowboat whacking it, you know, whacking the hull of the aircraft carrier from my rowboat. And some people hear me whacking um, and find the whacking gratifying, <laughs> um, but the aircraft carrier sails on. So it would be hard to um, it'd be hard to say that there's been a you know a sea change in, in Israel coverage. I think if anything, it's it's become worse. There have been you know points of light. I think Dia, who's actually a close friend of mine, Dia Hadid, is an excellent reporter and um, she's producing very interesting stories from the Palestinian side of things. Um, and there are other reporters doing a good job. But in general, the caricature of of Israel. Um, or the framing of Israel's predicament um, as being disconnected from the rest of the Middle East because that's the key trick that's been pulled here. It's not we ha they hate Israel or whatever. It's that Israel, which exists in the Middle East, the West Bank is a 90-minute drive from Syria. Um, it's, in, it's in the Middle East. Um, it's been framed as an Israel-Palestinian problem, 
even though most of Israel's wars have not been against the Palestinians, and Israel's most potent enemy at the moment is Iran, which isn't Palestinian, and Hezbollah isn't Palestinian, and the Islamic State isn't Palestinian. And so obviously it's not an Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and it's framed as having begun in 1967, right? It's about the occupation, and should the occupation be reversed, the conflict would be over, but the Palestine Liberation Organization was founded in 1964, which is three years before there was an occupation, and the, and the conflict dates to the 20s, as, as many of us know. So clearly it's an older conflict. Um, it's a much more complicated story than, than, than as is reported, but it's very hard to budge that simple narrative that people like so much. It, it resonates in the, in the West for reasons that I think are basically creepy and which I've written about, but it's pressing very deep buttons in the West um, for reasons that are complicated and kind of buried in the intellectual DNA of Western societies. Next question is right here. So you write that the Four Mothers Movement was the last charge of the kibbutzim mm. and that they've receded into the margin where they remain. Um, I've met Israelis recently who, they're secular, Tel Aviv, high tech, and they talk about Israel sort of like that, what happened to my country, dude, mm -hmm. feeling. Is, is that related to what you wrote about with the kibbutzim receding into the market? Sure, just to explain, the Four Mothers Movement was a protest movement that um, um, was led by mothers of soldiers, and that ended up essentially uh, dismantling the military strategy in Lebanon and getting the army out. And the, um, they were heavily from, from kibbutzim, which is the old elite of Israel. Um, and if you look at this historically, you'll see that the Four Mothers Movement was the last great success of, of that, of the Israel rooted in the kibbutzim. Um, they were heavily invested in the peace idea of the 1990s, as was I, for example. Um, you know, the idea of a compromise, um, that we could reason and withdraw our way out of our predicament, that we didn't have to fight, that we could withdraw. That was the Four Mothers idea. That was the peace idea. Um, and the, the, when that idea came crashing down, as the right had always said that it would, um, then the right became politically ascendant and the left collapsed. And the left has basically been, um, been on the ropes since then. And I think there's definitely a feeling among you know, certain, certain Israelis, um, Tel Aviv as a metaphor for those Israelis, right? Secular, um, Ashkenazi of European background. A lot of those people um, find it hard to come to terms with the people who are currently leading the country, who are um, more religious than, than they, who are heavily supported by, by Mizrahim, Likud voters, um, you know, big, the big block of Likud voters are, are Mizrahi. So there are kind of cultural fissures in Israel that are, that are in play, not always visible to, um, to, the, uh, to the outsider. Um, so yes, that's a, that's a very, I think, key sentiment for many Israelis, and it's being broadcast internationally. Um, a lot of um, the experts that international reporters, for example, interview about Israel are those people who feel very embittered about having been replaced by a different elite. Um, and I think that's a key kind of secret driver that hides behind a lot of the poison that you'll hear about Israel coming from, from the Israeli left. Um, they're happy to blame Israel's impasse on the fact that there's a right-wing government and on the fact that they are no longer in power. Right? If only they were in power, there would be no impasse, everything would be okay. Now that, I happen to have warm feelings for the old elite, okay, it was a good elite, um, but that's ridiculous. Right? Israel's impasse is because we're in the Middle East, it, um, you know, we could improve our situation somewhat, and I wish we would, um, but um, it's, a much, it, it's a more complicated story. But I think you've put your finger on a very important sentiment that's worth, worth knowing about when you come to understand Israel today. Next question up here in the front. I, I was curious, I was curious what news sources you regularly read, um, especially things that we may not have heard of. Um, I read Philip Gurevich. Um, um, I, I, <laughs> I um, try not to read daily coverage that much. And that's been my conclusion over, you know, the, with this bombardment of, of news and you can really lose yourself in the daily events, not just in Israel, anywhere, you know, the daily political cycle and the, the politics and Netanyahu said this and Abbas said that and rocket here and, um, and then if you wake up, you, know, you kind of wake up three months later and you've learned nothing, and nothing's, nothing's changed. Um, so it's kind of a waste of time. Um, I now try to read books which give you a kind of handle on the broader sweep of, of events. When I do need to read daily news, I read mostly Israeli uh, media. If you're looking for a decent English language website that does a good job of wrapping the daily stuff, the Times of Israel um, does a pretty good job of that. And you have some excellent um, international reporters who do a good job, like, like Dia Hadid, who I 
who I mentioned, and, and, and there are others, but it's, it's hit and miss. Um, and you have to be very careful what you read, and you have to be very aware of where most international reporters are coming from when they, when they report the story. You need to be very skeptical, I think. Um, um, you, know, you need to ask you know, how, did the people speaking with this very confident tone about what's going on actually know what's going on. Um, and, and the answer in many cases is no. So I've become a suspicious consumer of, of all media and a, a, a believer in, in books more than in daily right. news. Can you recommend any books that you've read recently that? Um, there is a book that was published a year or two ago called Like Dreamers by Yossi Klein Halevi, um, who traces the lives of seven paratroopers from 1967 um, as a way of explaining the fault lines in Israeli society since then. Um, there was a book that did quite well in the States called My Promised Land by Ari Shavit. Um, there are older books, um, a great book, which you wouldn't think would be great in terms of understanding Israel now, but it is, is a book about the British mandate called One Palestine Complete by Tom Segev. Tom Segev's written a number of excellent, excellent books. Um, there's a, a book on the birth of the settlement movement called The Accidental Empire, written by Gershom Gorenberg, mm -hmm. um, which is excellent. It's an excellent kind of glimpse at the way the settlement project was um, conceived essentially by the left, which is not what people think. Um, and I, th those are uh, you know, off the top of my head. Has your book been published in Israel yet? Th uh, this one is supposed to come out in the fall in Hebrew. That's not it yet. The next question is right over here. Question for Maddie Friedman. Um, big, big fan and uh, grateful to your observations on the oh, thank you very much. Ben, the mic isn't on. They really know their audience if they don't give away the mics. <laughs> A uh, question for Maddie Friedman. Um, I'm a big fan and grateful for your observations on Israel and how it's seen in the world. Um, uh, but I have a slightly tangential question, which I hope is fair. As I was reading the first half of your book uh, this week, I couldn't help but uh, think of the, uh, the parallel that Hezbollah itself finds itself in now, in, <laughs> in, embroiled in a war in Syria. Their, uh, one of their top commanders was just killed this week. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on you know, your former adversary in southern Lebanon and what they might be going through and how that in the long run may affect Hezbollah and Lebanese society? That's a very interesting, that's a very interesting point. Um, I think that you know, Hezbollah's idea, the Hezbollah idea is not to build a better society in Lebanon. Right? It's not war as a tool for the betterment of you know, the place you're from. It's not a continuation of politics by other means, which is the way we understand it. If you read their literature, and um, the deputy secretary general of Hezbollah published a, an important book in English, which is called Hezbollah, the story from within, and, which is really worth reading. And he kind of lays it out. And the idea is not um, even to win. The idea in South Lebanon fighting us was not to liberate South Lebanon, not only to liberate South Lebanon, it was to build in Lebanon a resistance society, a society that's dedicated to war, basically, to religious war as a religious precept and to death in battle as a kind of ideal for young, for young men. It sounds crazy to Westerners, right? So we often dismiss that kind of rhetoric as, as rhetoric or you know, talking to the base when uh, they actually have rational goals in mind. They um, fought their way out of their predicament, which is that they're weaker than the West and weaker than Israel by inverting the story and, and telling a story in which perpetual war is victory. Death is victory. The suicide bomber is, that's the idea. That death is a kind of victory. And if you believe that perpetual war is victory, you, you win, you always win. Um, and it's I, tragic and ironic to see them reap the fruits of their, of their ideology because you want perpetual war. Well, it's not always gonna happen on your terms. Right? That idea gets loose in the Middle East. It's going to be turned on you, and it has been turned on them and tragically on millions and millions of other people as part of the kind of cataclysm that we're witnessing in, in the region. So there's no joy in, in that observation for me, but they are one of the, um, the originators of, of the idea. And if there are deep thinkers in, in Hezbollah or critical thinkers in Hezbollah, and there might well be, I'm sure they're aware of the, of the irony. With the rise of Al-Qaeda and ISIS, 
and the terrorist bombings in Europe, it seems as if international coverage has really shifted and no longer is it framed entirely through the prism of Israel. Do you think that that uh, shift in both framing and attention is going to affect U.S. and European Israeli policy? Um, that, that's a good question. I, uh, from what I can tell, um, you know, for example, from a French proposal that we're hearing about over the past week or two to, to convene a peace summit, um, the Americans have certainly um, remained, um, you know, very invested in the idea of a peace of a peace settlement between Israelis and Palestinians. In a way, I think the Israeli-Palestinian thing, or the simple conception of what the Israeli-Palestinian thing is, because it isn't that, but the simple idea of what it is, is something to cling to in the Middle East for many people in the West, because the whole region is so hard to, to explain or understand. I mean, try to explain the Kurds and ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra and the Iranians and the Russians and the Israelis and the Americans and ISIS and Assad and Mubarak and Sisi and the Muslim Brotherhood, and you have to understand all these things to understand what's going on. So you, that's impossible. Um, Peace between Israel and Palestine, that sounds pretty good. So I think in some way, people grasp at this as something, something they can understand and, and affect in the Middle East. And you can't, because it's connected to the broader mess in the Middle East. But I'm not convinced that the mess in the Middle East, although it has siphoned off some of the reporters, the staffs in Israel are smaller now than they were um, when I began working for the AP. But there's still, it's still disproportionately covered. When Israel goes boom, as it did in the summer of 2014, everyone comes back. So Israel trumps, when Israel is happening, it trumps any other news story. The summer of 2014 um, saw the appearance of the Islamic State um, in earnest. Boko Haram was on a rampage in Nigeria. There was a whole thing in Ukraine that people might uh, remember, an airliner that was shot down by a pro-Russian militia. Israel trumped everything. Hundreds of foreign correspondents covered Gaza, and basically Gaza dominated that summer. It's still the most important story on earth, as I called it in that essay. What w you mentioned before that you didn't start writing afterwards because you didn't have perspective. So what was the point that you got, that you gained this perspective? And then also, when you went back, did any part of your experience returning clash with your memory of that location? Hmm. Um, I, I did try to write about it uh, immediately, but it just didn't go, it didn't go very well. Um, and then I dropped it. I was kind of dropped it and I assumed that this memory would just recede, which is what happens to most of your weird memories from when you were 19. Um, and instead something different happened. The memory of this place got stronger and stronger and I started to see the pumpkin everywhere. So I would see the Americans in Iraq, which started happening 2003, right? And, um, and it, looked, it looked familiar, convoys, IEDs, videotaped attacks, suicide car bombs, outposts, um, Afghanistan. Um, um, it, it all started to look very, very familiar and eventually it took me years, but eventually I realized that what I had seen at the pumpkin hadn't just been important to me, which is what I thought when I initially started writing about it. I just thought it was important to me. Um, I realized that it's important for an understanding of, of the Middle East and uh, the Middle East is important for an understanding of the world because the Middle East refuses to leave us alone it, it you know won't it won't let go so if we want to understand the world right now i think the pumpkin is a pretty good place a pretty good place to start and that's why that's why i went back there was a second part to the question which i've managed to forget was there anything that surprised you oh when and i went, went back, back it was like not didn't jibe from the other side of the it was very or? strange to stand on that hilltop uh, alone it was quiet it was just rubble um, I, wasn't in, I wasn't quite alone, as I read in the book, but all the soldiers were gone, and there was a Hezbollah flag flying from the top of the outpost, but even the flag was faded and torn, and obviously no one had been up there to put a new flag there, and the place felt completely unimportant. Uh, it was, you know, it's still the, the center of my emotional universe, and for others, um, but I think I realized that it was, it was unimportant, so you know, it had been worth our life and then it was worth nothing. And in, in retrospect, that's the, that's the basic experience of, of being a soldier. One day, the, you know, this hill that you're supposed to defend or capture um, is worth your life, or this trench, or whatever. And then a week later, it's worthless. And that's kind of a, that's what it means <laughs> to wear a uniform. I'm gonna take one last question. I just wanna remind everybody to join us in the back immediately after for the book signing. Thank you. Thank you. You say that Israel is still the big story uh, internationally. What it, significance do you think that has on anti-Semitism in the world today? Ooh, all right. This should, shouldn't take more than three or four hours. You'll, you'll see that. 
Um, I think you can say it's significant. What? It's significant. It's significant. It is significant. Um, I think that I think pe people in the West, Western societies, have a tendency to use. Jewish people as a blank screen onto which they project certain moral characteristics that um, are of interest to a society at a given time. So in the early years of the church, it was theological problems like an overemphasis on legalism and a lack of compassion. That was big for a while and is still big in some quarters. Uh, greed, um, if you were a communist, then Jews represented capitalism. And if you were a capitalist, Jews represented communism. And if you were a cosmopolitan, then Jews were tribalists. And if you were tribalists, Jews were cosmopolitans. And um, if you were into science then, or, or race theory, then Jews represented what was wrong. Um, there's a deep, vi there's a, a, a virus kind of it's, that's what it is. It's an intellectual virus that afflicts people in the West, including Jews, um, that uses Jews as the illustration of what's wrong. And I think that when you look at the very unique reaction to Israel and to Israeli actions in the world, uh, things like, for example, um, the fact that the UN Human Rights Council has condemned Israel not more times than any other country, which would be crazy, but more times than all other countries in the world combined. You know, and that is that has happened with very little comment. Um, um, and there are, many other, there are many other examples. I think that you need to um, at least be made, open. Uh, this is made up of like Syria, Zimbabwe, Iran, North Korea, right. and the United States or something? Something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you need to be, we need to be open to the idea that, there are, that this isn't news. It's not a news story. Israel, the Israel story doesn't behave like a news story um, in terms of staffing, in terms of duration. It's not, I mean, if we're covering Israel more than China, it's obviously not a, new, that's not a news decision. It's not a news story. It's a morality story. And that's why it behaves so differently. And that's why it presses such deep buttons. And that's why the response to Israel isn't like the response to Turkey, which has two concurrent occupations and is a member of NATO. And, and you know, it's not like the response to any other country in, in the world. So I think that those things are connected. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to Philip and to Matty, oh, especially. So